Jesus. Well, I've been given a uh, gift today, and I'm going to open it up in front of you. This is a gift that has been given by our worship team, and it is a uh, star. What a beautiful gift, especially as we begin this Christmas season. How appropriate, because it was, you know, the star. It was the star that guided the wise men to Jesus. It, it was the star way up in the sky that, that identified the birthplace of the Messiah. It was a star that illuminated the little town of Bethlehem. It's a star that illustrates for us how God could use a small town like Bethlehem to introduce for us the world's greatest gift. This morning we begin a brand new sermon series that we're simply calling The Carols of Christmas. Over the course of this Christmas season, we're going to take a look at the biblical foundation of some of our most beloved Christmas carols, Christmas carols that you know and Christmas carols that you have sang through the years, Joy to the World. We're going to be studying that next week. Hark the herald angels sing. Silent night on Christmas Eve. We're going to be studying the significance and the history of Silent Night. And then, uh, as always, we'll conclude our Christmas Eve service in a candlelight way, singing Silent Night. And then we'll end the month talking about our response to the Christmas story and the song, Go Tell It on the Mountain. Now, as we've contemplated what songs we were going to study, several people have asked me and begged me, and I just can't do it. I've had several people come up and say, Brian, are we going to study the theological significance of Grandma Got Run Over by a Reindeer? <laughs> and um, we, we, we thought about doing that. We, we just tried our best. We couldn't find any biblical verses to be able to back that up. Today's carol, as, as you heard the group sing, today's carol is, O Little Town of Bethlehem. And as you'll hear in just a few moments, we'll hear about what prompted the writer of that song to write it, but we're also going to see the biblical significance of that Christmas carol. And so take your Bibles with me today and turn to the book of Micah, Micah chapter 5. In Micah, we find the biblical significance of O Little Town of Bethlehem. Probably familiar with this story. Uh, if not, it'll be new for you, and um, I trust that it'll be a blessing. Micah chapter 5, beginning in verse 2. I'll read. I'm reading out of the ESV. You follow along. We'll put it up on the screen. Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. Micah says this, But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah. From you shall come out or come forth for me, one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from old, from ancient of days. Therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel. And he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth. Notice the first phrase of verse 5. I love it. And he shall be their peace. Jesus shall be their peace. And Jesus is our peace. Would you pray with me today? Father, as we meet together, we are reminded of what this Christmas season is all about. We're reminded this Christmas season is not about us, it's about you. This Christmas season is not about getting, this Christmas season is about giving. And Lord, I pray that you would remind us of those truths. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us as a church to, to look for opportunities to give, not just to you, but help us to look for opportunities to give to others. As Brad and Kelly mentioned, help us, Lord, in a, in a, in a real and palpable way. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to make a, 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 an impact on our community during this Christmas season. 
And so, Father, I pray that you would teach us from your word today. Help us to understand, Lord, not just what this hymn is talking about, but help us to understand what your word is teaching us in Matthew chapter 5. And I pray that during this Christmas season, our lives would be dramatically changed. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Philip Brooks was burned out. During his day, he was known as the most dynamic and inspirational preacher in the United States. But Philip Brooks had lost his passion. He had become the pastor of Holy Trinity Church in Philadelphia in his mid-20s. And in just a short period of the time, that, that, that small congregation had grown to a large congregation of well over 1,000 people. The future looked bright, not only for the church, but the future looked bright for Pastor Philip Brooks as well. But then the Civil War came, and, and, and the mood of the church completely changed. Husbands and sons began to die in battle. And every day it seemed like there were more and more of his congregants that would come to church all dressed in black. Their heart was broken because they had just lost a beloved family member. Philip Brooks relates that darkness fell over every facet of the worship services. As a pastor, he tried to be inspirational and to encourage his church, but quite frankly, the situation was draining him. And then the war ended, and Pastor Brooks thought that his passion, his vitality, and his joy for ministry would return, but it didn't. Then, you're familiar with history, President Abraham Lincoln was assassinated and the pain, both, both national and personal, for Philip Brooks intensified. Although Philip Brooks was not Abraham Lincoln's pastor, he was asked to preach President Lincoln's funeral. And he did. Ultimately, though, he experienced such discouragement, such depression, even as a pastor, that he asked his church for a sabbatical. He just had to get away. So Philip Brooks left his church in Philadelphia and traveled to the Holy Land. It was on Christmas Eve in Jerusalem when Philip Brooks mounted a horse and went off riding in the dusk. When the first stars began to shine in the sky, he rode into the tiny village of Bethlehem. At that, town, the town, at that time, the town had changed very little since the birth of Jesus Christ. And just riding into the town of Bethlehem seemed to lift Brooks' spirits. Why? To be within a few feet of the very place where Jesus Christ was born. That night, Philip Brooks participated in the Christmas Eve service of the Church of the Nativity, which is right over the spot, the traditional spot where Jesus was born. And Philip Brooks relates that that night, he felt surrounded by the Holy Spirit of God. Later, Philip Brooks wrote, I remember standing in the old church in Bethlehem, close to the spot where Jesus was born. When the whole church, ringing and singing hour after hour with, with splendid hymns and praise to God. And Philip Brooks stated that at that moment, in that church, his spirit, his vitality, his passion for ministry was reinvigorated. He went back to his church in Philadelphia and later became the pastor of Trinity Church in Boston, Massachusetts, one of the great historic churches in our country. Three years later from returning from that trip, Philip Brooks sat down on a Christmas Eve and wrote the words to the song that our choir just sang a few moments ago. O oh, little town of Bethlehem. You see, it was, it was the truth of Bethlehem. It, it was the person of Bethlehem that reinvigorated Philip Brooks. I sit back and think, wow, that's powerful because I go through times of discouragement. Do you go through times of discouragement? Uh, 
we all go through times in which we're feeling either depressed or, or frustrated or discouraged. And, and, and what is it that gets us through those moments? Family helps. Chocolate helps, does it not? No doubt about that. A lot of things help. But what gets us through that moment is the reality of what took place in the city of Bethlehem. As we mentioned a few moments ago, the, the biblical basis for this hymn is found in Micah chapter 5. Let me give you, as we begin today, just a few introductory facts about Micah and about the book of Micah so that you understand the context from which we're pulling and we're studying these verses today. The first thing I'll mention is this, is Micah ministered to the southern kingdom of Judah. If you know much about, about the history of Israel, Israel during specifically Old Testament times was divided into two sections. There, there was the northern kingdom which involved ten tribes and there was the southern kingdom which was made up of two tribes. Micah was a prophet not to the northern kingdom but he was a prophet to the southern kingdom. Now even though he was a prophet to the southern kingdom, it was Micah among others that predicted the fall of of the northern kingdom. If you've read through the Old Testament, you'll realize that the Babylonians came in and they first of all conquered the northern kingdom. It was Micah, one of the first prophets, that predicted that the Babylonians would come. You know, kind of like Paul Revere said, the British are coming. It was Micah that said, the Babylonians are coming. And they did, just as Micah prophesied. But he not only predicted the fall of the northern kingdom, but he preached to the southern kingdom telling them, you know what, if you don't straighten up, if you don't reject idolatry, if you don't turn back to God, God will discipline you. He will discipline us just as he is about to discipline the northern kingdom. Micah has been called the prophet of the poor and of the oppressed. I love the prophet Micah because he not only had a passion to preach God's word, but he had a passion to help the disfortunate. He had a burden to reach out to the down and out. He had a burden to lift up those that were, that were downtrodden. He had a, a burden to encourage the oppressed. If you read through the book of Micah, Micah ministered during a time of political and religious corruption. Now, not only was was the political, the governmental system of Israel corrupt during that time, but the religious system was corrupt as well. And so here's Micah proclaiming the word of God, not only to a city that was led by corrupt officials, but to a country that was spiritually led by corrupt spiritual leaders. And over and over again, he declares to the people and to the religious leaders, thus saith the Lord. And he preaches the importance of turning back to God. It it was during this time of of hopelessness. It was during this time of uh, both political and uh, and religious depression that, that Micah gives a prophetic word. A prophetic word that that not only provided hope for the nation of Israel, but now thousands of years later, a word that provides hope for us as well. So this morning as we focus on the prophecy of Bethlehem, I'd like to highlight two simple yet two very important facts. The significance of Bethlehem, and then as any passage should points to the son of Bethlehem, points to none other than Jesus Christ. So notice, first of all, the significance of Bethlehem. So, so, so we ask the question today, what was it about Bethlehem that gave the nation of Israel hope? In the midst of hopelessness, in the midst of depression, in the midst of corruption, what was it about Bethlehem that all of a sudden lifted their spirits, that gave them hope, that all of a sudden gave them a reason, both physically and spiritually, to carry on. What was it about Bethlehem that lifted the spirits of Philip Brooks there in the 1860s? And what is it about Bethlehem that encourages you and me today? 
Notice several things that I put in my outline. The first is this. When we talk about Bethlehem, it's important for us to realize that its size precluded it from being mentioned among the towns of Judah. Let me say that again. Its size precluded it from being mentioned among the towns of Judah. The carol that we just sang, you know it. The title is what? O humongous town of Bethlehem, right? Oh, oh, metropolitan city of Bethlehem. Is that what it says? No, it says what? Oh, uh, little town of Bethlehem. But, but, well, that truth is not only seen in its geography, but, but that truth is seen in, in the biblical passage as well. We saw in verse 2, he says this, But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be listed among the clans of of Judah. What in the world is Micah talking about? Well, if you're familiar with the Old Testament, both Joshua chapter 15 and Numbers chapter 11 list for us the towns of Judah. And when you look on the list in Joshua chapter 15 and Numbers chapter 11, you will notice that one prominent little town is left out. It's excluded. It's not mentioned. Which town would that be? Bethlehem. Why in the world does, does uh, Joshua not mention Bethlehem? Why is Bethlehem not mentioned in Numbers chapter 11 among the towns of Judah? The simple reason is this. It was too small. Most towns under 1,000 inhabitants under 800 to 1,000 in population simply were not mentioned. That's the way Bethlehem was. I sat back and, and, and looked at our state of Florida and tried to find some towns that, that, that were similar to Bethlehem. Let me, check, let me test your geography of the state of Florida. By the way, Steve Gillis is here today, one of our former elders. I love Steve and Cindy. We're glad that Steve's here. Steve might know these places because he lives up that way. But, but, but how many of you are familiar, anybody familiar with Noma, Florida? The metropolis of Noma, Florida. No, nobody knows of Noma, Florida? No, Noma, Florida is up in the panhandle just south of, uh, of the Alabama line on the I-10 corner. It is a huge town of 209 inhabitants, all right? Not important to us, important to the 209 people that live there, but not important to us. It is a what? It's a small town. How many have ever heard of Pine Level, Florida? Anybody ever heard of Pine Level, Florida? We have one or two, Jim. One or two have heard of Pine Level, Florida. Pine Level, Florida has the population of 227 inhabitants. It's located 30 miles east of Sarasota, if you're interested in getting your car today and traveling to Pine Level, Florida. Now listen, those are, those are small, out-of-the-way places where very few people live. That's the way that Bethlehem was. If you would have traveled to Bethlehem during Micah's day and even during the time when Jesus was born, Bethlehem would not have impressed you. Bethlehem was a suburb of Jerusalem. It was located five miles south of Jerusalem and it had a whopping population of some 150 people. It was small. It was insignificant. Yet I find it very, very interesting that that is the place that God chose as the doorway for the entrance of the Messiah, the King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords. Man, if it, if it would have been me, I would have chose the metropolis of Jerusalem. I mean, I would have chosen someplace really special and big. But listen, church. That's not the way God works. He does that sometimes. But often, God takes the small things of the world, and God uses those small things in a big, in an extraordinary way. I don't know about you, but that encourages me. You might be sitting back saying, Brian, why is that? You're not very small. Listen, I know I'm not very small, but, but, but I am somewhat insignificant. And I'm so grateful that God takes the insignificant and uses them in a significant way for the cause 
of Christ. Paul says it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, that God shows what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God shows what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God shows what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are. Why is that? So that no human being might boast in the presence of God. (laughs) I love that. God takes that which is small, and uses it in a big way. That's exactly what he did with Bethlehem. But listen, even though Bethlehem was small, doesn't mean that it didn't have a great history. The second thing that I wrote in your notes is this. It's history, even though small, it's history elevated Bethlehem to a place of national importance. At least three major Bible events had already transpired. By the time that Micah wrote his prophecy, at least three major Bible events had already taken place in this little, small, insignificant, unnamed town. You say, Brian, what were those three things? Let me mention them to you quickly. First of all, Jacob's wife Rachel was buried there. Now you remember, let me give you a little bit of Old Testament history. Jacob was the son of Isaac and the grandson of Abraham. His wife, Rachel, produced two sons, Joseph and Benjamin. You remember the story. While delivering Benjamin, Rachel died. Genesis chapter 35 and verse 19 tells us of her death. So Rachel died, and she was buried, the text says where? In Ephrath, that is Bethlehem. So so Rachel was buried in Bethlehem. The second is this. Ruth was redeemed and married in Bethlehem. Remember Ruth, the, the, the main character of the book of Ruth? Ruth was a Moabitess that married Boaz and became the great grandmother of King David. It was in Bethlehem that the events of the story of Ruth take place. Go home today and read the book of Ruth. You can read it in just a few short minutes. It was in the city of Bethlehem that all of those events took place. When Boaz married Ruth, the leaders of the city came together and gave Boaz a blessing. And I'll read the last part of it. It says, may you act worthily, Boaz, in Ephrathah and be renowned, where? In Bethlehem. It was in Bethlehem that the events of Ruth took place. And the third thing is this, you know this, it was in Bethlehem that King David was born. It was in Bethlehem that King David was anointed. Everyone knows David, Israel's greatest king, obviously apart from Jesus Christ. Israel's greatest king was was born and anointed in the city of Bethlehem. For Samuel chapter 16, verse 1, the Lord said to Samuel, how long will you grieve over Saul since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn, go, I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite. Here's what he says. Pack your suitcase, Samuel. Hop on a train. I'm sending you to the city of Bethlehem. Because in Bethlehem, you will find Israel's future king. So even though Bethlehem was just a small town that was not mentioned among the cities of Judah, all right, its history elevated it to a place of prominence. But I want you to see a third thing about Bethlehem before we study Bethlehem's native son. The third thing is this. Its name demonstrated its God-given purpose. You might sit back and say, Bethlehem, I don't get it, Brian. What, uh, What does Bethlehem mean? Here's what Bethlehem means. It means house of bread is what the name means. Because the area around Bethlehem was a grain-producing area in the Old Testament. And so they would, they would raise grain and they would, they would harvest grain. And it was in Bethlehem that the bread was made. So, so that town became known as what? Why, that is the, the house of bread. That is Bethlehem. Now, now think about that in in God history, because we know that history is what? It's his story. So, so we think about the name Bethlehem in the realm of God's history. How appropriate that the house of bread produced the bread of life. Doesn't that make sense? 
The house of bread produced the bread of life. It was Jesus who said in John chapter 6 and verse 36, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger again. And by the way, whoever comes to me will never thirst again. Here's what he's saying. I will satisfy all of your needs. Bethlehem means house of bread. Ephrathah means fruitfulness. Basically, Ephrathah distinguished Bethlehem. There was another town in, Beth, in, uh, in, in Judah named Bethlehem. And so Ephrathah distinguished which Bethlehem it was. Here's the cool thing. Today, you can walk through the streets of Bethlehem, as I'm sure some of you have done. A few years ago, I had the opportunity to walk and spend a day in the city of Bethlehem. It's easy to mistake Bethlehem today for any other modern city in the Middle East. But Bethlehem is not any other modern city in the Middle East. It's the city that God chose to introduce his son. That's what Micah says. That's what the song says. Oh, little town of Bethlehem, how great you are among all the cities of Israel. Micah tells us a second thing, and the song, O Little Town of Bethlehem, is not just about the town. The the song, O Little Town of Bethlehem, in Micah chapter 5, is about a person. It's about the son of Bethlehem. It's about the Savior that came from Bethlehem. So it not only focuses on the significance, but it also focuses on Bethlehem's greatest son. This passage mentions four prophetical and yet very powerful truths about Jesus. Let me mention them to you today. The first is this, when we talk about the son of Bethlehem, we see that he is sovereign. Now, now, now have your Bibles. I want you to kind of walk through the passage with me, all right? All right, I want you to be a Bible student today. I want you to see what Mike is saying as we walk through this. So, so notice verse 2. We've already read the first phrase. But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, notice, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel. All right, this verse, now, now think with me. This verse is not speaking of any of Israel's great rulers. Some today, some historians are trying to say, no, 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 this, uh, these verses aren't prophetical. These verses aren't messianic. These verses aren't talking about Jesus. They're just historical verses that are talking about another king. Well, it's important for us to realize that Micah 5 is not talking about David. For David had already lived when these verses were written. These verses are not talking about Hezekiah, who probably was born at this time, but Hezekiah wasn't born in Bethlehem. This verse is not talking about Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel was born in Babylon. There is only one person that fulfills the prophecy of Micah chapter 5, and guess who it is? It's Jesus Christ. And so Micah says, listen, he, this child that will come from Bethlehem, he is sovereign. Notice the latter part of verse 2. It says this, whose coming forth is from old, from ancient of days. The New King James says it this way, whose goings forth are from old, from everlasting. The NIV says, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. What do these verses show? What does this verse show? It clearly shows us the eternality and the sovereignty of Jesus Christ. You see, the son of Bethlehem existed before he came to Bethlehem. The ruler of Israel was the creator and the sustainer of the universe that lived from eternity past. He has ruled from everlasting to everlasting. And so Micah says, man, this child that is about to be born, who is he? He is the sovereign one. He is the ruler, not only of Israel, he is the ruler of all the earth. Let me pause for just a second. And can I ask you just a personal question? Because you would probably agree with me today and say, yeah, Brian, I believe that. 
Jesus is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. He is the ruler. Okay, here's a question for you. Is he ruling in your life today? Is he just a historical leader? Is he just a religious leader? Or is he your leader? Is he sitting on the throne of your life? You see, it's so easy to go about our lives and believe intellectually in all these things that we're talking about, but for that truth not to transform who we are. Jesus doesn't just want us to know him in a way. Uh, intellectually. He wants to change me. He wants to change you. And that happens when I step off the throne of my life and I say, Jesus, have at it. All right. You are not only the king, you are my king. You are not only the ruler of Israel, you are my ruler. Not only do the Israelites bow down to you, but Jesus, I bow down to you today. Oh, Jesus, you are my Lord. You are my Savior. Is that true of your life? Is that true of your life? It's one thing for us to recognize his sovereignty globally. It's another thing for us to recognize his sovereignty individually. Is he on the throne of your heart? Micah tells us a second thing, though. Not only does he say that this child, which will be born in Bethlehem, is sovereign, but he says he is the Savior. Notice verse 3. I want to read it, then I want to explain it, because it's a little ambiguous. Verse 3 says this, Therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel. If you're like me, you read that and you say, what in the world does that mean? And you probably put a big question mark there or jump over it as if it's absolutely clueless. Here's what the verse is saying. The verse is saying that the Lord would give Jews, the Jewish people, the Israelites at that time, up to trouble. Notice, therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. You see, from the time of this prophecy that Micah gave this prophecy to the birth of Jesus Christ was a time of great trouble for the Jewish people. Not only was their country invaded and their city besieged by Sennacherib in Hezekiah's time, but some years after that, they were carried captive into Babylon. And when they returned, it didn't get much better. They, they met with many enemies that disturbed them while they were trying to rebuild the city and the temple. Man, they went through all kinds of tribulation. Yet here's what Micah says, man. God's going to give you up. You're going to go through some problems. But this child one day is coming for the purpose of freeing you from your struggles. Of freeing you from your problems. Of liberating you from your enemies. You see, here's what Micah says. The child that will be born in Bethlehem will save his people from their enemies. You sit back and say, Brian, that, that still hasn't happened because, man, Israel in a lot of ways is still struggling with enemies today. Man, that prophecy is still going to be fulfilled because one day Jesus will reign on the throne of David and he will liberate his people from their enemies. But listen, catch this church because it's easy for us to check out at that point and say, okay, prophecy for Israel I'm not Jewish, doesn't apply to me, all right? It applies to them, great facts to file away in the back of my head, but it doesn't apply to me. Listen, ultimately Jesus did not come to save the Israelites from the Babylonians, from the Persians, or from the Romans. Why did Jesus come? He came to save his people and you and me from our sins. Matthew said it this way in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 21, and she shall bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. See, Israel didn't know it, but they were about to be in a heap of trouble. 
Israel didn't know it, but they desperately needed a Messiah. They desperately needed a Savior. And quite frankly, they wouldn't realize that for years and years to come, and many still have not realized that. And before we become way too critical of them, listen, let's sit back and realize that we ourselves don't realize how much we desperately need Jesus. Because just as the Israelites were surrounded by the Babylonians and the Persians and eventually the Romans, you and I, church, we are living today in hostile territory. We are surrounded by enemies. And, uh, and, and before you look and say, yeah, man, my neighbor is an enemy. <laughs> Maybe he or she is, I'm not sure. But, but your greatest enemy is not your boss. It's not the neighbor that you don't get along with. Your greatest enemy is the world, the flesh, and the devil. It's ourself at times when we allow ourselves to give in to the temptations of this world. And Mike is saying, listen, you might be in bondage today, but there is a liberator that is coming. There is a savior that is coming, not only to liberate the Israelites, but one that is coming to liberate So maybe you're here today and you say, man, Brian, I get it. Man, I feel in bondage today. Man, man, I feel like I'm chained today either by a relationship or a situation or a struggle or a temptation or an addiction in my life. Brian, I am in captivity today. Well, the child of Bethlehem came to free you from that captivity and to save you not only from your enemies, but to save you from your enemies sins. And yet, quite frankly, we often don't realize that. Yesterday, I don't know whether you know, we have a service here every Saturday morning with our, with our food pantry, and, and kudos to Thomas and his team. Our service is growing every single Saturday. And this gentleman who's here almost every Saturday, by the way, this guy comes in and doesn't, doesn't even get food. He just comes in every single Saturday, missing a leg, chopped off at the knee, and he hobbles in on crutches every single Saturday. I'm standing in the back of the auditorium, and he, and he hobbles in on crutches, and he walks up to me. I think Mike was already leading. The service had already started. He walks up to me, and he says, Pastor Brian, let me just ask you a question. Can I ask you just a simple question? I said, absolutely. He said, how many people really understand the meaning of Christmas? I said, wow, what a great question. What a great question. Not many. We get so wrapped up in the trappings of Christmas, in the materialism of Christmas. And believe me, there's nothing wrong with a Christmas tree. We have one. There's nothing wrong with gifts. I hope y'all are going to get me one for Christmas, all right? There's nothing wrong with any of that, all right? But it's not about those things. It's It's about the fact that we're in bondage, and God loved us so much, he sent somebody to free us and to liberate us. And we fail to realize it. Micah said, and he's the sovereign. He's not only the sovereign, he is also the savior. He mentions a third thing in the passage. He said, he is the shepherd. Notice verse 4. And he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord is God. And they, God's people, shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth. How blessed it is to know that the Lord is our shepherd. Can, can you say with the psalmist today that it is Jesus the shepherd that leads you into paths of righteousness? Can you say today that it is the shepherd that that leads you to green pastures and still waters where, where you find rest and nourishment? Can you say that it is Jesus, the shepherd, that walks with me through the valley of the shadow of death? Do you know Jesus? And one of the things that we have the privilege of doing and yet have the burden of doing is is being beside people who are approaching death. We have several people in our congregation that are going through some huge physical struggles, and the doctors haven't given them long to live. And, and, uh, you know, myself and Thomas and and Matt, our deacons, we we sit with these people, and sometimes it's, it's so difficult. What do you say to somebody who might not be alive in two weeks for Christmas? 
What do you say to somebody who's afraid to go to sleep at night because they don't know whether they're going to wake up or whether they're going to pass from this life? And sometimes you sit and we tell jokes and we try to do it, but the only thing that I can do is to tell them about Jesus because it is the shepherd who is promised to walk with them even through the valley of the shadow of death. He promises to pastor us during the good moments of life, and he promises to pastor us during the difficult moments of life. Are you allowing Jesus to pastor you? With our staff, we just went through a great book. I think uh, one of the ladies' classes is going through the same book. It's by Kyle Eidelman called Not a Fan. And the idea is this, Jesus doesn't want us to be just as fans. Churches are filled with people who are fans of Jesus. Go Jesus, give me a J, give me an E, I can cheer with the best of them. But Jesus didn't come to earth to create a bunch of fans. Jesus wants followers. Jesus wants people who are going to recognize his shepherdship. People are going to recognize his leadership. And people who are going to be willing to follow him. Man, I, I take great comfort in the fact that he is our shepherd. As, a, as pastors, when we meet myself and Jose and Brad and Thomas, we remind ourselves on a regular basis and we console ourselves on a regular basis that there is a pastor that is over us. And that pastor is none other than Jesus Christ himself. The apostle Peter calls him the chief shepherd. That's who he is. Are you allowing him to shepherd you? Are you one of his sheep, first of all, today? He said, my sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. Are you one of his sheep? And if you are, are you following his leadership? He gives a fourth thing in the passage. The fourth thing he says is this. He's not only our sovereign. He's not only our savior. He's not only our shepherd, but he is our source of peace. Notice verse 5. I just took that, that, that first verse. It says this, and he shall be their peace. Now, now remember, Micah wrote during a period of turbulence. Michael, Micah wrote during a, uh, during a period of political and religious upheaval. Micah wrote during a time when, when there were demonstrations in the streets. Micah wrote during the time when people were complaining about what was going on, not only in their government, but in their religious community. He was writing during a time of civil unrest. He was writing during a time in which there was no peace. And here's what Micah says. The person of peace is coming. He is your peace. Man, 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 here's the challenge. It does not matter what is happening around you. If you are a child of God, you have the Prince of Peace. You have the personification of peace living within you. And so whether there's peace on the outside, you can have peace on the inside. He is our source of peace. We talk about Jesus being our peace. Three things I'll mention. It's not in your outline. First of all, Jesus came to bring peace to the earth. Remember the angels there on that, on that Bethlehem hillside, the angels came and they sang what? Peace on earth and goodwill to men. So much during the Christmas season, man, we promote, we talk about peace. Countries who are at war have ceasefires. At least during Christmas, let's have some peace. Families stop fighting on Christmas. At least I hope they do, all right? It, all right, if you're fighting on Christmas, let us help you with that just a little bit, okay? All right, Jesus came to bring peace. Now, that's not going to happen worldwide until the future. One day when he sits on the throne of David, there will be worldwide peace. He came to accomplish it, but it's certainly not accomplished now. He came to bring peace on the earth, but he also came to bring peace with God. You say, what does that mean, Brian? Very simply, when you and I sin, we put ourselves in opposition. To God. All of us are. We don't, we don't intentionally become God's enemies, but our sin puts us on the other side. And all of us need reconciled. 
And the only way that you and I can switch sides, as it were, is through the person and the death of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul says it this way in Romans chapter 5 and verse 1. We are justified by faith, therefore we have peace with God. So here's my question today. Do you have peace with God? As you lay your head on the pillow at night, do you have peace with God? Not because you're perfect, but you know that even the sins that you've committed are covered by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you realize that today, God is not mad at your sin, not because you've, you're doing a great job, but simply and solely because of Jesus. He is our peace. And when we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, at that moment we're justified, we're declared righteous, just as if we never ever sinned, and at that moment we have peace with God. That's what he wants to be for you. The last thing he, he gives us is this. He gives us not only the peace with God, but he gives us the peace of God. If you're familiar with Philippians chapter 4 and verse 7, the apostle Paul says, in the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. He is our peace. He is your peace. Man, life's hard, is it not? Can I get an amen? amen. Life's hard. It might not be hard for you today, but it will be tomorrow. Or, or it was yesterday. On a regular basis, I have folks sit in my office whose heart is broken. Yesterday I did. A couple that's just struggling with some unbelievable things in their life. And, and, and I'm able to look at them and say, listen, God offers you peace. Even though you're walking through the valley now, even though you feel like the weight that you have on your shoulders, you can no longer bear. The Apostle Paul says, and the peace of God. Where did Paul write the book of Philippians? He was in jail when he wrote the book of Philippians. Even in prison, the peace of God, which passes all understanding, rules your heart and your mind in Jesus Christ. He is our peace. So today, as we conclude, let me ask you, do you know the child of Bethlehem? Is the child of Bethlehem your savior? Is he your shepherd? Is he your sovereign? Is he your source of peace? The last verse of O Little Town of Bethlehem says this. It says it so powerfully. Let me close with this. O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us we pray, cast out our sins and enter in, be born in us today. We hear the Christmas angels, the great glad tidings tell, oh come to us, abide in us, our Lord Emmanuel. Is he abiding in you? Do you have the peace of the child of Bethlehem in your heart? That's what he offers to you today.